Okay, we're back. Welcome to Asia in Review on ThinkTech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called the 20th Anniversary of the Turnover of Hong Kong. We're going to talk about taking a look at the future of Hong Kong and China's long plan for Hong Kong, which is still unfolding. If you want to ask a question or participate in the discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-437-2014. Our guest for the show is Frank Ching, a formerly of the Wall Street Journal, who joins us by Skype. Uh, June 30th marks the 20th anniversary of the handover of, of Hong Kong to China by Britain, and President Xi Jinping came to preside over the celebrations. He delivered a major speech. Frank Chin can tell us about this. He was with the Wall Street Journal in the 1970s and 80s, and in 1979 he opened the Wall Street Journal Bureau in Beijing, staying there for four years. Before that, he worked for the New York Times in New York, and after that, in Beijing, after Beijing, he was with the Far Eastern Economic Review, which is another Dow Jones publication from 1992 to 2001. Currently, he's a syndicated columnist. His columns appear in English language newspapers in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. He's also an adjunct associate professor in the business school of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where he teaches MBA students a course about China, and its external relations. Welcome to the show, Frank Ching. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Jay. Good to be here. Well, let's talk about what happened. Uh, there's a lot happened on uh, June 20th, and I want to know what happened exactly and why was it important? Well, the Chinese President Xi Jinping came to Hong Kong for the 20th anniversary, and he delivered a major speech while he was here. Uh, and in his speech, he said, and I'm quoting him, any attempts to endanger China's sovereignty and security, challenge the power of the central government and the authority of the basic law, or use Hong Kong to carry out infiltration and sabotage activities against the mainland is an act that crosses the red line and is absolutely impermissible. So uh, that sums up uh, basically uh, what he was uh, trying to say, that Hong Kong there are certain things that Hong Kong cannot do. It cannot challenge China's sovereignty, uh, and uh, this means that it cannot uh, say that it wants to be independent of China. It's, yeah, a, direct, this is, uh, it's a direct re reflection on the umbrella movement, isn't it? Well, it's. It, I think it's a direct response to uh, some young people in Hong Kong who have been calling for independence or localism. Actually, localism uh, it should not be that um, uh, unacceptable because in Shanghai people say, oh, we're Shanghainese, <laughs> and in other cities they, they uh, have a certain loyalty to their own city. But in Hong Kong, the concept of localism has sort of uh, become linked to the concept of independence. And uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, made it very clear that independence uh, of Hong Kong cannot be tolerated. Well, you know, if, if I were to look at Hong Kong, say, in uh, the year, what, 1998 uh, or 7, um, and, uh, ex and, and sort of project forward, would I have expected this? It sounds like to me that the sense of um, independence, if you will, a holdover from, uh, you know, the British uh, uh, territorialization of, the, of Hong Kong, um, would have led to a more independent state of mind right now. It sounds to me like China's long plan is to, is to wrap around Hong Kong and not to consider any kind of independence. Is that the same as it was in 1997 or 8? Or have we evolved into a more, mm, more control by China of Hong Kong? Well, I, I think China uh, has never said that Hong Kong can have any degree of independence. The word used was autonomy, that is Hong Kong is meant to enjoy what is called a high degree of autonomy. So Hong Kong uh, issues its own passports. Uh, Hong Kong uh, has its own uh, membership in international organizations. Hong Kong uh, issues its own stamps, its own currency. Uh, these are all things that uh, other uh, parts of the uh, uh, country would not normally do. So Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy, but no no idea of independence is uh, uh, included in this. So uh, I think President Xi Jinping was saying that Hong Kong uh, can enjoy autonomy, 
that we can never think about independence or sovereignty on its own. That all of China's, uh, Hong Kong's powers are delegated by China. And if China doesn't get delegate any power, Hong Kong will not have any power. So, so that's what, a message what, what from the uh, government. What level of autonomy does that allow? I, mean, I, I certainly appreciate that there's a big distinction between autonomy and independence, but what level of autonomy would he permit, would the uh, would Beijing government permit? Well, uh, the Beijing government has permitted, uh, I think, a, a great deal of autonomy from 1997 to now. Uh, the problem is that uh, this is under the concept of one country, two systems. And in the beginning, 20 years ago, uh, the Chinese government emphasized two systems. Now increasingly, it's emphasizing one country. Saying one country uh, is uh, the, uh, necessary uh, before you can have two systems. Now, I think uh, some people in Hong Kong think that uh, China is so unhappy with Hong Kong that it would be a way of one country systems entirely. I personally don't think that will happen. I think China will re redefine this concept of one country two systems so that it will have more, more authority uh, than it has had or has exercised so far. A, uh, a contact of mine in Beijing uh, has told me that they have studied the basic law, which is Hong Kong's constitutional document, and discovered that there are many areas where the central government can actually play a role. And they had so far refrained from doing anything. Uh, but in future, they, they may exercise that authority. And uh, one example is that all Hong Kong legislation uh, is sent to Beijing. And Beijing, if Beijing uh, does not uh, reject it, then it becomes law, it's law in Hong Kong automatically. So far, for 20 years, Beijing has never rejected a piece of Hong Kong legislation. But maybe in the future, they will start doing this. They will start exercising the power that they have. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the long plan. And, I mean, if, and, I, and of course, I'm not there, and I'm not an expert on this, but I would have predicted this. Wouldn't you predict that over time, the long plan for, for, for China is to uh, keep a, a short leash on Hong Kong, because ultimately they want to control it, and they don't want any talk about independence. and whatever autonomy there is, it's a limited autonomy, and it's re revocable even, don't you think? Well, I think Beijing certainly wants uh, control over Hong Kong. And I think uh, if you look back over the last 20 years, the uh, the best period was really the first term of uh, CHC, the first chief executive, 1997 to 202, when China uh, really did not appear in Hong Kong's internal affairs. And Mr. Tung, very interestingly, uh, gave an interview last week. Uh, and he disclosed that uh, at one point, uh, when the Hong Kong dollar was under attack by speculators in the United States, he called up Beijing and asked for help, asked them to send a couple of people to Hong Kong to help deal with this financial problem. And Beijing told him, no, this is your problem. This is one country, two systems. We're not going to send anyone to Hong Kong to deal with this problem for you. And actually, Hong Kong does everything uh, itself. And I think uh, it handled the situation very well. But it does show that the chief executive in Hong Kong thought it was proper to ask Beijing for help under one country, two system. And Beijing was the one who said, no, no, you do it yourself. So I think a lot, a lot of what systems is really defined by the amount of self-restraint on the part of China. Yeah. That is, China has restrained itself from coming to Hong Kong and exercising powers and, and, and uh, interfering in, in local affairs. If China doesn't restrain itself, it's not going to work. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, it's not terribly consistent between control and not helping. You'd think there would be a more avuncular kind of relationship uh, and that China would see um, see a role, a value, if you will, in in helping uh, in helping, just as uh, you know the federal government would help would help the states. Uh, but I guess this is this is not exactly that kind of relationship. Uh, that's right, and I think that uh, China wants greater control over Hong Kong than it has had in the past, and we know that the 
uh, under the basic law. The Chinese National People's Congress interprets the basic law. It's not interpreted by uh, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the most recent interpretation was about the taking of hopes. Now, last October, after the last legislative elections, a number of uh, pan-democratic legislators took the oath in a very funny way, uh, like they deliberately mispronounced the name of China, <laughs> injected uh, phrases that were not in the oath into the oath, and uh, added things at the beginning and the end, and and did things. And the Chinese uh, National People's Congress issued an interpretation of the uh, oath uh, ordinance in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, sorry, of the basic law, saying that uh, these things mean that the oath was not validly taken. Yeah. And therefore, the people are not uh, legitimate members of the legislature. Yeah. So, uh, two, two members in October, two members uh, were in fact expelled from the legislature. And yesterday, the High Court in Hong Kong decided that four other members uh, did not take the oath uh, properly and should uh, leave the legislature. Now, uh, that means that six members uh, were to leave the legislature, and that means that the, the balance in the legislature is changing. The uh, pan-democrats used to have the power of veto. See, a major legislation needing two-thirds majority. So as long as the pan-democrats have, uh, say, a little over one-third, they can block major legislation. Now they've lost six seats they can no longer block it. And we'll see what happens in the by-elections. The government have to hold by-elections to fill those seats. And uh, uh, the Democrats, I think, have said that if they are individual seats, they can retain them. They can fight to uh, keep a seat. But a lot of these constituencies have two seats. So if they win one seat, and then the other camp, they win the other seat, which means overall that the Democrats are going to lose some seats. The plan is still unfolding, isn't it? But you start to get the idea that there's not a lot of slack here. And I wonder if, uh, if freedom of speech is somehow ultimately going to be impinged. Because uh, as I get it, the press has been quite free in Hong Kong, and maybe still is free. But do you think there's going to be an impl you know, a, a limitation of that going forward? I, I think that um, I'm not sure I, I understood your question. Uh, Properly, but I think in Hong Kong, uh, from the very beginning, that is before 1997, the great fear among the people has been that they would lose their rights and their freedoms. Yes. And and over the last 20 years, I must say that the rights and freedoms have largely been respected. Uh, people can continue to uh, hold candlelight vigils in honor of the Tiananmen Square victims every uh, June 4th in Hong Kong. Uh, they can continue to demonstrate. In fact, there are more, more protests in Hong Kong today than there were before 1997. <laughs> this is well, that's funny. good, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, the, the thing is, now uh, the question is democracy. Now, the British never allowed democracy in Hong Kong. Up to the time the British agreed to return Hong Kong to China, every seat in the legislature was appointed by the governor. There were no elections to the legislature. Now, every seat is elected in one way or another. So I think to the extent that Hong Kong has some democracy now, it's really uh, due to China, to China's credit. But the uh, people in Hong Kong want to see the, the top person, the chief executive, elected by universal suffrage. And China has promised that that would happen. But then uh, China announced in 2014 the conditions under which they happen, and uh, the candidates would have to be nominated by a nominating committee. The nominating committee would more or less be under Beijing's control. I should emphasize it's more rather than less under Beijing's control. Uh, so people feel that they will only be able to choose between candidates who have been vetted by Beijing and, and approved by Beijing, uh, and that this is not a, a genuine uh, election. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, this is the uh, the main point, and under the rules that the Chinese government, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, have drawn up, it may be impossible for a Democrat 
to ever become a candidate. That is, that the nominating committee will never nominate a Democrat to be a candidate. So uh, therefore, the Democrats are very much against uh, this uh, package from the central government. Uh, and uh, if this comes up again as an issue, and it uh, very well may, uh, then it will create uh, a great deal of tension in society again. And I think that Terry Lamb, the new chief executive, doesn't really want uh, political issues to be brought up. She wants to talk about livelihood issues, housing and so forth. Yeah. They should make some progress. Uh, whereas if you talk about political issues, uh, there will never be any progress. There will be turmoil in the legislature. Now, uh, the uh, democracy issue, of course, is pushed by the Democrats. Uh, on the other hand, there are pro Beijing forces, including the central government, who want to see uh, Article 23 legislation in the United States and Hong Kong. Article 23 of the basic law says how Kong should uh, enact legislation against subversion, secession, sedition, treason, uh, theft of state secrets, all kinds of political crimes. And uh, we tried to do this back in 2003, and half a million people came out and protested. Yeah. And the then, then withdrew. And it's never been enacted. Now, under the basic law, Hong Kong has a lifetime uh, of 50 years uh, of one country, two systems. And 20 of those 50 years have gone by, and Hong Kong still hasn't carried out this obligation to enact uh, such laws. And Beijing is putting pressure on Hong Kong, yeah. uh, pointing out that Macau has already done it, and tried Macau did it some time ago. And uh, I think that Terry Lam will have to start the process of enacting this legislation. And this, again, will be very controversial. Uh, I think one way of reducing the controversy is not to introduce a big package of uh, call it the National Security Bill, but enact it in small, uh, in bits and pieces. So some of these laws are already on the books. Uh, under the British, they had laws against treason, for instance. So we don't need to do it all over again. Uh, so I think if we do uh, you know, one thing at a time, it may create less controversy in society mm -hmm. uh, rather than having a, a huge package and have a lot of people would disagree with one or another element within that package. So uh, you talked about uh, issues around livelihood, and I guess that's economics. And I just wonder if we could get a, a handle on it from you about um, the, the, the whole notion of taxation. Uh, I imagine that part of the tax that's collected in Hong Kong goes to Beijing, and I no. also imagine no. that uh, there's a represent representative from Hong Kong, or more than one perhaps, that serve on the Politburo or serve in some legislative represent representative capacity in, in the Beijing government. Is that true? Is that the kind? Of, you know, that's what we have in the U.S. Does that happen in China too? I'm um, sorry. Uh, Hong Kong does not pay taxes to the Beijing government. Ah. It's uh, this was announced uh, very early on that Hong Kong uh, would not have any obligation to pay taxes to the central government. And Hong Kong uh, people do not have to serve in the Chinese military. They don't have the military obligation either. Uh, and they do not have to pay for defense. Uh, under the British, Hong Kong people pay for British soldiers being stationed in Hong Kong. Uh -huh. and, and, and China then said uh, they, will have, they will station troops in Hong Kong. They will pay for them. The Hong Kong people will not pay for defense costs. They will not pay for mm. taxes. To the what, what about no. the representation? Are they, is Hong Kong represented in the Politburo? Is it represented in, in Beijing? Uh, sorry, the Politburo is a party uh, body. Uh, you have to be a Communist Party member. Uh, so the part, Communist Party elects people to the Central Committee, and Central Committee members elect the Politburo members. Nothing to do with uh, Hong Kong. Mm. Generally speaking, uh, the uh, Hong Kong uh, does have members serving in the National People's Congress, uh, and uh, in the advisory body, the CPPCC, it's the Chinese People's Political Conference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's a high-level advisory body, and on that advisory body, uh, there are now two Hong Kong vice chairmen. Uh, the first Hong Kong chief executive, Tong Chi Kuang. After he stepped down as chief executive in Hong Kong, he was appointed a vice chairman of the CPPCC. Uh, and now, 
see who I love, who, who just stepped down as chief executive, you know, called. He, had, he too has been appointed a vice chairman of the CPPCC. So the vice chairman of the CPPCC are considered uh, leaders of the party in the states. In, in China, if you're above a certain level, uh, the uh, head of the vice, uh, vice chairman of the National People's Congress or vice chairman of the CPPCC, you are considered to be a leader of the party in the states. So now there are two Hong Kong people in that elite group. Okay, well, that is something. So uh, going back to Xi Jinping, this was an important speech he gave because it was an important event. Uh, is it, does the 20th anniversary uh, more important than the 10th or other anniversaries? Is his appearance, is his speech on, on, uh, in, Jan in June, uh, you know, uh, an important political event uh, for him? Um, what, what exactly drives him to make this speech? Well, I... He made this speech because of the 20th anniversary, and I think he wanted to lay down certain ground rules so that Hong Kong would understand uh, what it's uh, supposed to do and what it's not supposed to do. And, I, and of course, he did not talk about uh, political reform that is leading to universal suffrage and so forth. But I thought it was interesting that throughout his speech, he talked about economic development. And he said that development can help uh, cure some of Hong Kong's other problems. And I, I thought about this, and uh, actually Hong Kong every year, every July 1st, uh, has a protest against China. This is ironical because July 1st is a public holiday in Hong Kong because uh, that marks the day of China. Hong Kong's return to China by Britain. So it's a public holiday to celebrate the return. But actually every July 1st there's a protest against China in Hong Kong. And people can march because they don't have to work as a holiday. Now, I mentioned that in 2003, half a million people protested. This year, it was the smallest protest in 14 years. And I think that this is because of economic development. Uh, the uh, economy grew, I think, in the first quarter of this year by about 4%. Uh, this, is, this is very good um, for a developed economy. 4% growth is very high. Uh, and Hong Kong today is very different from what it was in 2003. Yes. And 2003, it was very high unemployment. The stock market uh, plummeted, property prices plummeted, uh, and there was negative equity. Government had five years of budget deficits. Uh, today, it's the opposite. Uh, the economy is doing very well. Uh, there is virtually no unemployment. Uh, there are there are problems. Young people. Uh, difficulty getting housing, uh, and uh, I think getting a job is not that difficult, but getting a good job with prospects uh, is difficult. So uh, I think that uh, when things are going well, people don't feel like going out and marching on the streets. So this time, it was the smallest in 14 years. So I think that Xi Jinping had a point that if we focus on economic development, some of your political problems will recede also. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, a few years ago we read that uh, Shanghai had been designated a special uh, special zone of commerce uh, with the idea that it might uh, be a, a portal, uh, perhaps another portal, different than Hong Kong, but nevertheless a portal for China to deal with the world. And um, I, I suppose that's made uh, Shanghai even more um, even more prosperous than it was before. But how does, how does the Shanghai um, you know, business portal compare with Hong Kong as a business portal? Because you know, Hong Kong has been responsible for uh, providing capital to China, doing deals with China, acting as an you know, investment portal for all of China and maybe other places in Asia. Um, but I wonder what, how you would compare Hong Kong now and Shanghai now, and, and how you would see them both going into the future. Are they going to compete? Is one going to be uh, more, more advantageous than the other? Well, uh, this is something people have been talking about for, for ages. The competition between Shanghai and Hong Kong and whether Shanghai will overtake Hong Kong and, and Hong Kong will become a backwater. Uh, I think uh, over the last 20 years, uh, since Hong Kong uh, became part of China, Hong Kong has been China's international financial center. Shanghai has been China's domestic financial center. Uh, and I think that this situation will 
probably continue as uh, to be an international financial center. You have to have some things uh, that the rest of the world uh, would take for granted. You've got to have uh, freedom of information to be an international financial center. But why do you feel that? I, mean, I guess this is based on the fact that Hong Kong has a long 100-year tra tradition of being a, a global business center. And that gives it an advantage, uh, or at least it gives it a special, a special uh, characteristic that puts it, uh, puts it ahead of Shanghai, which is within the, the lap of the Chinese government. Yeah. Well, I think this, uh, the special characteristic is really rule of law. That is, uh, if you don't have rule of law, uh, other companies are not going to trust your law. They're not gonna, going to allow you to adjudicate. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong, uh, 20 years after the handover, still has rule of law. Uh, it it uh, has an independent judiciary, uh, and I don't think Shanghai has that. I think no, nobody has argued that Shanghai has that. Mm -hmm. And if Shanghai doesn't have these things, it cannot aspire to be an international financial center. Mm -hmm. so unless, China, unless China changes, I think Hong Kong will continue to have this advantage over Shanghai. Well, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, he made it clear that he was not going to tolerate independence. Um, and I think that probably has a profound effect on people because I think they take that as a, as a kind of threat. Anyone interested in independence would take that as a kind of threat. But if, if that happened, if there were, a, say, a movement for independence and people nevertheless uh, reacted uh, by, by encouraging and participating in activism for independence, what would happen? What would China do? Do you think China would become um, you know, more aggressive about dealing with individual activists? Oh, China will crack down on Hong Kong if it sees Hong Kong uh, as being a hotbed for independence. Even though it is impossible for Hong Kong to be independent. But if you look at uh, Tibet, for instance, it's impossible for Tibet to be independent. And yet, China is so fearful of Tibetan independence. And in Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghurs, it's impossible for them to be independent. And yet, China is cracking down constantly and cracking down very, very hard. So if, if China should view Hong Kong through the lens of uh, separatism, that Hong Kong uh, is a place where uh, separatists uh, are Hong, uh, Hong Kong will pay a very heavy price. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope it, it does not happen. I hope people realize that. Yeah. And it's not, uh, it's not a Hong Kong can be communist. Hong Kong cannot. I, just, I wonder how you know how did people react? How did the market react? Um, how did the how did the news media react? How, how did you react uh, in, in to the speech, um, and to the the comments about independence, um, to the you know the historical significance of the event, um, and Xi Jinping's remarks? I mean, uh, how did people feel? If you went out on the street, what would they say? And what did you say in your writings? Uh, well, I I thought it was a very uh, firm. Speech. That is, he, he made it very clear what China's position was, uh, and I think that people in general have accepted this, uh, this knowledge that this is China's position, that this is a line that China does not wish Hong Kong to cross. I think people have accepted this, uh, and I, I think that they they probably uh, will there probably will be a change in uh, behavior mm -hmm. on. The Democrats. That is, I don't think uh, they will come out openly and, and call for independence. Or, um, as far as taking oaths is concerned, I think in future they will be more serious about taking uh, the oath of office. Mm -hmm. You know, it strikes me that uh, we, we see now is sort of the continuing expression of stand up China. What I mean is China realizing its destiny, a kind of manifest destiny uh, in Asia. I mean, and that's, that's expressed by the uh, you know, the aggressive steps in the South China Sea and, and other geopolitical maneuvering. And, uh, you know, it strikes me that um, that, that represents a, a new kind of expansionistic attitude in Beijing and that, um, and that its attitude toward Hong Kong would be along the same lines. It would be part of that expansionistic manifest destiny, uh, stand up China, uh, have influence really all over Asia. Is it, do you agree? Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree. Uh, except, of course, uh, Hong Kong is part of China, and uh, from the same point, it's not expansionist. Uh, but uh, 
China has certainly adopted a, a very uh, hardline position vis-a-vis -vis the South China Sea, for instance. And uh, the countries in Southeast Asia individually cannot stand up to China. Mm -hmm. And the United States, uh, under Donald Trump, has sort of receded. And, and uh, our, as, as the U.S. recedes, uh, China very naturally moves into the vacuum. Yeah. Uh, and Chinese power, I think, is now greater than ever. Uh, uh, but I think China is also uh, susceptible because you, you see that Wu uh, Xiaobo just died, and China has come under very heavy criticism from all around the world. Uh, and I think that uh, from a moral standpoint, the Chinese leadership realizes that it is seen as lacking moral legitimacy. Mm. And uh, it uh, wishes to change that, but I don't think that it can change unless it changes its behavior. Yeah. One last question, Frank, and that is, uh, and you mentioned it in passing a minute ago, is uh, Donald Trump and the United States. The United States has uh, seen a, a sort of decline of its influence in the area. It's just as China has risen, the United States has declined, and, and now uh, Donald Trump is trying to f figure out options, of which there are very few, to deal with North Korea, and for that matter, to get China to help him deal with North Korea. Uh, how, does, how do the events uh, and Xi Jinping's speech in Hong Kong, how, what does that tell us about relations between the United States and and China, and for that matter, the United States and Hong Kong. Well, is this a barometer of where we're going here? Well, uh, I think as far as the uh, relations between the U.S. and China uh, are concerned, uh, you can look at what Donald Trump uh, said uh, yesterday, I mean, the day that uh, Liu Xiaobo died. Donald Trump was asked what he thought of Xi Jinping, and he said, oh, he said, we're, we're good, good friends, he's a great man. And that's uh, what's good for China, uh, and all, all these things. And it was left to the Secretary of State to make a statement about uh, Liu Xiaobo, uh, staff, and that China should allow its widow to go overseas. Uh, so I, I think that uh, you don't have to look at uh, how uh, China is in Hong Kong to, to understand the U.S.-China relationship, because that's, that's very much in the open. As far as the U.S.-Hong Kong relationship is concerned, I think that... Uh, uh, China is very sensitive to foreign interference, to what it considers to be foreign interference in, in China, and especially in Hong Kong. Uh, and it, it believes, it seems to believe that uh, a lot of these uh, protests and so forth are somehow being supported by foreign governments, uh, specifically the United States. Uh, I don't believe that that is the case, but the uh, Chinese government is, is pushing that uh, line and saying that the U.S. was behind, uh, well, behind the 2003 protest and again behind the 2014 protest. Uh, and I, I think that the U.S. is uh, being very circumspect uh, to make sure that its officials are not uh, seen to be involved in any of these things. Uh, in fact, the, the last U.S. country general uh, told me about a, a communist newspaper publishing his photograph uh, and saying that here he is meeting of student leaders and of course it was not him <laughs> it was not his photograph and he pointed this out to Chinese officials who were very embarrassed <laughs> well, you know we live in changing times I mean and especially in, in, uh, in Asia uh, a, a couple, three years ago, a fellow named Simon Winchester wrote a book called Pacific here at the East-West Center, and he spoke of the emergence of China and the fact that the United States had less influence and would continue to decline in influence in that area, and that was just the way it is. It is just the way it is, the way history turns. And I wonder if you could just offer us some, some words on how you think it will go in the future. Uh, what is it going to be like? not only in the, in the relationship between Hong Kong and China, but in the influence of China around Asia. Is it going to be a continuing increase in influence? Uh, what do you see uh, accelerating that or standing in the way? Well, I, I think China's influence in Asia is going to increase. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in the South China Sea, and if China in fact has already won. Uh, China has total control of the South China Sea. The U.S. can send in a freedom of uh, navigation, can, conduct the freedom of navigation at 
exercise. If you want to, then its ships come and then they leave uh, and brings uh, the flag to the way you are, that is under Chinese control. Uh, and it's not just Asia. I think China increasingly is influential all around the world. Um, look at Norway, for instance, the country that gave Isha Bar the Nobel Peace Prize. The Nobel Peace Prize Committee issued a statement uh, on this. Uh, the Norwegian government said nothing. Even though China had punished the Norwegian government and uh, because of the uh, Li Xiaobo nomination, which had nothing to do with the government, was the committee. Still, China punished Norway for years and years, uh, and now Li Xiaobo died. Norway is totally silent. Uh, and I think uh, you look around the world, very few, people, very few governments have spoken up. Uh, so I think that China's influence is increasing, and it's likely to continue. Yeah. And the U.S. under Donald Trump, I think, is virtually committing national suicide. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> allowing its own influence to decrease and allowing China's influence to, to move in. Yeah. And, and in, in the paper yesterday, today, in the Times, I think, uh, there was a report that China was now sending a, a fleet to man a new base, a military base, that it was establishing in East Africa. Now that is really, has holdings in Africa, lots of activities, lots of projects and developments, but this is more than just business. This is military geopolitical power. I think that's going to happen elsewhere, don't you? Yeah, uh, China for a long time uh, boasted that it had no military bases around the world. Uh, and now uh, it, it does. It, uh, and this is the first one that will have military bases elsewhere. Uh, it will become more and more like the United States. <laughs> China wants to become a superpower, and its motto is the United States. Whatever the U.S. does, China wants to do. And whatever the U.S. is capable of doing, China wants the same capability. So uh, I think China uh, realizes that in order to project power, it cannot rely on uh, its navy to uh, project power if it doesn't have bases. So now it's starting to have military bases. Although yeah. it's calling this, I think, a logistics facility, but it's really a military base. Yeah. It's learned a lot. It's learned a lot from us, it's doing the same kinds of things we have been doing. Anyway, Frank, it's been wonderful to talk with you. Uh, you've seen it all. You've covered it for decades and decades. Uh, what an interesting you know, journalistic situation you've been in. Um, I admire that so much, and I hope we can continue to check in with you from time to time to find out how this all evolves. It's the most exciting part of the world right now, I think, and the most uh, <laughs> profound changes are happening. Very true, and I'll be happy to chat with you from time to time about uh, these issues. Uh, and I think there will be more interesting issues uh, coming up in the months, uh, years to come. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frank Ching, a journalist uh, formerly with the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and now a journalist with ThinkTech, don't you think? Thank you, Jay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know I, I was with the Wall Street Journal many years ago, but I'm no longer uh, with it. Yeah, uh, I understand. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah, thank Aloha. you so much. Aloha.